All right. All right. <laughs> the witness of the scripture this morning is from the Christian Testament as translated by the Reverend Wilda C. Gaffney. It's John 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening of that day, the first of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples were closed for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you all. And having said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Messiah. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you all, just as the living God has sent me, so I send you all. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve who was called Didymus, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him about it. We have seen the Messiah, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the holes and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And within eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, though the doors were shut, and stood among them and said, Peace be with you all. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hand. Bring your hand and put it in my side, and do not doubt, rather believe. Thomas answered him, saying, My Savior and my God. Jesus said to him, Was it because you have seen me that you believed? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. The Witness's Spirit is from The Inward Journey by Howard Thurman. I seek the enlargement of my heart that there may be room for peace. A word of God that is still speaking. so much. Good morning, church. Can you all hear me okay? All right. The, um, the podium back here, you might have thought was for Judy. It's actually for me. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to Reverend Adam for the invitation to be here today. And thank you all for your presence here in worship. <clears throat> I always enjoy when I go to visit churches, I enjoy um, witnessing how worship comes together. And it, and it really is a collaborative experience when we look at the Gospels, when we look at the, the texts of how the beloved of God gather for worship together. So 
uh, even the red light, green light that you all were doing with Judy was really wonderful to see this morning. So thank you for that. And uh, I'll let you know that I come from a tradition where it's okay to do that red light, green light. It's okay to talk back a little bit. So I come from a place where if you had invited me over for a meal and we're sitting down to the meal together and I might take a bite of whatever it is that you gave me to eat, you might hear me say, "Mm mm-hmm, or that's good. Now, in church, in the church I was raised in, people might say that in response to something they hear or something they feel, or they might say, okay. Or, or you may put it this way, if you were raised in church, because this is kind of a churchy word, you probably heard people say this, amen. You know what I'm talking about. You're familiar with that. So don't, don't, don't feel like you have to hold back, but if you say, watch out, now I'm going to be worried. <laughs> You're with me, though. You're with me. Okay. This is a progressive Christian church, right? Yeah, good. And, and so, all right, there you go. You're already warmed up. It's a good thing I didn't wear my clown costume after that children's story today. Sometimes, no, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. Uh, in, in progressive spaces, for someone with a marginalized identity, sometimes being in progressive spaces can feel like going into Whole Foods. You've been in Whole Foods before? Yeah. You've been home. So you're walking down. Imagine you're, you're just on your way home from a busy day. You just need one or two items. You see Whole Foods. You think, I'm just going to stop in. I can run in real quick, get my one or two specialty items, and I'll be right out. And you get in the parking lot. It's a little more full than you had anticipated, but you think, I can still zip in and out. And you get to the aisle that has the items that you need, and as you get into the aisle you see two people facing each other, bowing with eyes closed, offering namaste to each other. And they keep bowing and keep bowing, so much so that they have no clue you're there, and their carts are blocking the aisle. (laughs) Sometimes being a marginalized person in a progressive space can feel like going into Whole Foods where everyone has the best of intentions, but they're so blissed out in their Lularose or natural fiber clothing that they're completely oblivious that someone else might need something. And you might be the person who's polite enough to just say, I don't want to interrupt this blessing of each other, but I, excuse me, I, I just need to get, I just need which then repeats the whole bowing process. And now you're the one who's trying not to be rude, but you don't know how you got sucked into this bliss circle when all you need is something from the spice rack. Sometimes being in progressive spaces can feel a little bit like that. And I don't say that to tell you to stop doing what you're doing, but sometimes the only definition of peace we know is to tune everything else out. Sometimes the only definition of peace we know is the absence of worry or the absence of fear or guilt or the only definition of peace we've been given in our life is the absence of conflict. Is that true? Right? Or we think we can find peace or we can achieve peace with one more yoga class. If only I had time for one more book group. If only we had one more rainbow flag, surely we would be welcoming men. Now, I know here in Hillsborough you don't have to worry about that. So don't elbow anybody. I'm not trying to get you in trouble this afternoon at lunch. Before you tune me out, I want to give you an opportunity to receive a new definition from today's gospel lesson. In John chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus enters the room where the humans who've been following him are hiding. Reverend Wilda Gaffney, in her translation, uses the word Judeans because in the Greek text, there is no differentiation. In other words, The writer of the text is not saying the Christians were hiding from the Jews or Jesus followers were hiding from the Jews. The Jesus followers were Jews. So let's be truthful when we tell the story. She says the word Judeans is used because there's no distinction between Jews and Christians in the setting of this text, meaning the followers of Jesus 
are just plain old hiding. Probably from the citizens of Judea, which is a city filled with Romans and Jews and Arameans, all kinds of people. This is the first time, according to the stories we have collected in the Gospels, that the teacher appears to his followers after the resurrection. So I, I want you to stay with me here. We're some time after the resurrection, and still there are some followers, some friends of Jesus, who don't know that he's been raised to life. Now, we've shown up a week after Easter, having experienced last Sunday, but someone may have shown up today not knowing that there is good news. Are you with me, church? Some of them aren't even sure he's been resurrected, so they're present, doubting, but still gathering. Sometimes the pursuit of peace looks like being with your people even in the midst of fear and doubt. In verse 19, Jesus shows up and declares, Peace be with you all! How can he say that, though? Days before, they were arguing at the table, bickering over who, who would be on his left and who would be on his right. Just days before, Swords were drawn in gardens and secrets were sold for silver. And yet Jesus shows up and announces with generosity, peace be with you all. When just a few days prior there was wrestling for peace, in the wake of turmoil and despair, Jesus shows up to declare peace. Peace be with you, church. That's one of my favorite parts of the worship service, by the way. Next to, uh, on Sunday mornings, next to a potluck. Literally, that is, you would think that a preacher loves the sermon. I mean, I hear myself talk all the time. But next to potluck, like, that is my favorite part of being church. Because I get to fist bump, which I do just be a little bit more hypoallergenic. Or I'm a hugger. I love hugs. And it gives me a chance to remember we're all human beings. It's one of my favorite things about worship. It reminds me of being a child and going to Mass with my abuelita. It's a good Mexican Indian Catholic woman would drag her grandchildren to Mass, even though we didn't know Spanish at the time, or Latin for that sake. And we didn't know anything else in the service except when we, had, we, we were told to stand and offer peace to each other and communion. We knew those parts of it. We weren't allowed to take communion because we hadn't been baptized, but we knew when we could stand and turn to each other, and so we kind of made a game out of it. And that was one of my most favorite things in that space. I felt my grandmother's presence and her warmth, but I was keenly aware as a child that it might be possible that that peace and that space wasn't really meant for me. Just like communion. You, you can't take communion yet because you, you haven't done these things. The peace in that space was a limited offering. I have a friend, a colleague, da Dave, who started the Camino today. The Camino de Santiago, if you know, you're familiar with that. And he's going to be walking all week long the Camino, and he was texting me last night as he got ready, and he said, you know, I practiced walking, I practiced the hiking, I practiced for the hills, and I completely forgot to practice my Spanish. <laughs> 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 so he gets to Spain, he gets to his starting point, and he decides, I'm going to go to Mass the night before we start Mass, uh, the start the Camino. And Dave was texting me, and he says, I walked in, and... He said, I, I didn't understand any of what they were saying until we got to Jesus' prayer. He's like, w you can even pick that up through translation. And he, he knew the gospel reading uh, because he heard Thomas in, in the reading we had for today. And he said, as soon as I walked into that mass and mass began, I started crying. And he said, I knew I was going to receive the Eucharist. And then he said... Uh, in his text, it gave me chills. He said, I knew I was going to go receive the Eucharist even if I wasn't supposed to. 
See, David, like me, is, is queer. And so if you've been raised in spaces or even breathed air on this planet, you know that most spaces are not accessible for people who may be queer, trans, and for a long time, lesbian and gay. And so Dave was acutely aware that there were people in that space who may say, this is not for you. But Dave knew in his heart, even though he could not understand the words, that there was something there for him. Nothing was going to keep him from receiving the peace of Christ in that moment. For marginalized folk, we're used to the idea that something isn't for me. Grace isn't for me. Eucharist isn't for me. Surely peace isn't for me. Maybe you felt that way too at some point in your life. And yet in verse 20, Jesus shows up and greets his friends by showing his hands and his side and saying, peace be with you. By the way, we know from this text, from the Greek translation, that there were women present and men present and other gendered folk who'd been following Jesus since the beginning. So let's tell the full text of the story, not just a monochromatic one. And you may say, well, why does it matter? Because Jesus doesn't just say, peace be with you in this text. He doesn't just say, peace be with you, male-identifying folk. Peace be with you who are of European descent. Peace be with you if you've been born. I love Wilda Gaffney's translation because in this passage in the fullness of the Greek, Jesus isn't just saying, peace be with you like some of you. The specific pronoun, the, the attachment, the grammatically correct way to understand this passage is Jesus saying, peace be with you all. All. That was a good place for an amen. Jesus' messy generosity spills out as he declares, peace be with you all. We have to tell the full story, church. We didn't come here today for a small gospel. And Jesus shows up in person and brings presence of peace, an offering of peace. But is the all only for those who are in his presence that day? It can't be, because not all of them were there. So when Jesus says, peace be with you all, is it only for those who believe in him as teacher? Is it only for those who are gathered together that day? The gospel invitation for you today isn't just peace in the presence of the sacred. It's for you to live out peace in practiced ways. Because the truth is, not all the disciples were there that first appearing. So it's also possible not all those who need a good word are here today. Are you with me? Judas had already ended his own life. John will tell us that Thomas is not there in verse 24, and there's no reason given, by the way. We, we attach this, oh, well, Thomas was doubting. That's why he wasn't there. We don't actually know that. That's like inherited theology, which like some sweaters aren't that great after two or three generations. It could look good on someone else, but maybe you can recycle it. That's actually not in the text. There's not a reason that's given. Why does that matter? Because some of us get stuck on why folk aren't where we are. Why folk aren't where we are theologically, politically, but it doesn't matter to Jesus. Because was, when Thomas couldn't get to Jesus, Jesus practiced peace in the way that Thomas needed for him to believe. In verse 25, when 
Thomas hears about Jesus showing up in the upper room. He says, unless I see the marks in his hand and the scar in his side, I won't believe. And then the gospel says Jesus showed up and they believed right away and everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> That's not what happened. This is kind of the ridiculous part of this text, which if you just kind of read through, you miss. Jesus shows up. There's still people meeting who haven't seen him, who aren't even sure of what they've just experienced the last three years. And then Thomas hears about it, and Jesus still doesn't show up. Thomas literally waits another week. The text tells us he goes through a whole week. Now, I don't think Thomas is sitting around writhing his hands and going, I don't know, what do I do? In my sacred imagination, I see Thomas just living his life, doing the best that he can. And I trust that the community of believers that surrounded Thomas are still loving him no matter where his faith is. Are you with me? That is the exercise. That is the practice of peace. It's a whole week before Jesus shows up. I had an eighth grade uh, algebra teacher. I am not a fan of algebra. I had an eighth grade algebra teacher who also, this teacher, Mr. Osborne, he was also my youth leader at church. So it was like, yeah, it was like double whammy, right? Like, and I had to do good in class because I didn't want to hear about it in the weekends during youth group, which he never did. He had great boundaries, thank God. Uh, but when we were in class, every day, without fail, I kid you not, every day, we would have an algebra quiz. And I thought I was pretty good because I actually got most of the answers right on the quiz. It would, it would be like a four or five you know, question, quiz, nothing. It was just to practice our skills. And Mr. Osborne, the first thing in class, would say, pull out your quizzes. We'd do the quiz. We'd hand it to our neighbor because we did the neighbor grading, right? Which doesn't really cultivate like a sense of, hey, go for You did great. Most of the time, we're all competing with each other. Anyways, that's a separate issue. Uh, so we would pull out these. We would hand the quiz to our neighbor, grade it, and then hand it back to us. And the, every time... I would get like four out of five or five out of five. And then Mr. Osborne would collect the quizzes and he would go home and grade them. And I didn't quite understand why. And he, he would hand them back to us and without fail, if I got four out of five or if I got a perfect, sp perfect score, he would mark me down. And I would get the equivalent of an F. And I said, Mr. Osborne, I don't understand. I'm getting the right answer. Why are you marking me down? And he said, because in this class, I don't want to know that you have the right answer. I need you to show your work. Are you with me? Church, it is not enough in this day and age to say you have the right information. It is not enough in this day and age to say you have the right theology. You must show your work. What does that mean? It means that you not only cultivate the presence of peace internally, and I don't mean peace without problems. I mean peace in the midst of the storm. It means that you do that daily work your practice is to grow your presence of peace and then to live it everywhere you go. Because some people will receive peace through your presence simply by being in your space. But some people will need to know that you have done your work and they will only be able to experience peace by your practice of it by you interrupting microaggressions, by you doing your own internal work, reminding yourself this isn't about guilting or shaming. You're not wrong because you were miseducated. We were all miseducated. It means living the ways of justice, even though it's hard, and releasing this need to get it right. You're not going to get it right. 
One of my favorite coaches says, practice makes permanence. Forget perfection. Practice makes permanence. I need to know you're doing the internal work. I need to know you're doing the lifetime work of learning your own immigration story so that when you welcome immigrants, you aren't trying to be a savior, you're simply trying to be a sibling. Sometimes peace be with you all is just showing up and being present. Sometimes peace be with you all means you practice over and over again. Some folk will receive peace through your words, but for some, they will need to see how you live. Can I trust that you're coming in peace because you too have wrestled with fear, with hatred, because you've wrestled with your own loneliness, Peace be with you all as a presence and a practice begins to look like extending radical welcome for all God's beloved. Queer, straight, crooked, Republican. (laughs) Watch out now. Watch out now. I'm working on that one. You You can keep me accountable to that one, church. But you must continue to do the work of finding your peace, of receiving your peace. Otherwise, you will have none to offer to those who are fearful and confused and whose theology has made the divine into a commodity. I already told you a whole week goes by. Thomas is in this place for a whole week and his siblings just love on him. They just love on him. I don't envision them handing him pamphlets or giving him tracts. Can I take you to a class? why you shouldn't doubt. I have a bumper sticker for you. (laughs) The disciples have simply been practicing the rituals of togetherness, of inclusion, of sharing meals. Sometimes we define peace as only those big, fuzzy resurrection moments. But I imagine if Thomas isn't experiencing the practices of peace from his siblings day in and day out, despite not having seen the presence of Jesus yet. Peace for all must move beyond this room. Peace for all must move beyond your pew. It must extend to the people under your roof, to the people under your neighbor's roof, to the people who have no roof. The peace Jesus is declaring, the peace of Eastertide, the peace that we are called to pass must ripple out. And Jesus declares peace for all as both an offering of comfort to his friends and a radical resistance to state-sanctioned violence. Church, I'm convinced that never before in our recent history has there been a greater need for this peace. And I don't have time to convince you of all the reasons why if you don't believe that yet. Peace not just as an absence of war, Peace not just as an absence of abuse or an absence of violence. Peace that's rooted in love. Peace that's rooted in justice. Isn't it time we declare fully, peace be with you all? Not just by our presence, but by our practices, especially when it's not clear or easy. Maybe for you, the presence of peace is cultivating your own internal peace in the midst of a storm. Maybe it is cultivating a discipline of prayer or meditation. Maybe it is finding a book to read. Maybe it's a practice of asking someone new, not in a creepy way now. Do you have lunch plans? You know what I mean, like churches that are too friendly. You've all been to one of those. Don't be those. But asking someone, do you have lunch plans? I'd love to have coffee after with you. Maybe it's examining your accessibility. The dedication you're you're having for this lift, creating radical ways to welcome folk because we assume, we believe, we trust that people will show up who are not like us, who do not look like us, who don't walk like us, who don't have the abilities we have. And so we're making spaces accessible. 
Maybe it's sign language, or maybe it's an all-gendered restroom. Maybe it's interrupting microaggressions at your place of work, or having tough conversations with your neighbor who has a really annoying yard sign. Maybe it's celebrating what's happened in this community over the last few years. Maybe it's just celebrating that you're still here. Maybe the the presence and the practice of peace for you will be holding space for each other to grieve. I wonder if Jesus can extend peace to all, including those who betrayed him and those who stayed. I wonder if he can do that because he wrestled with his own anger and found his grounding in his own peace. Over the past week, sick communities celebrated what's called Vaisakhi. Vaisakhi is a springtime festival when sick celebrate the birth of the Khalsa. The Khalsa is the beloved community. It's committed to the path of the Saint Sapahi or the sage warrior. And Vaikasi is the time when families like mine share stories of how our ancestors walked the path of love, even in the face of pain and darkness. Maybe it's time for us to practice telling those stories with each other, church. One of my practices is to call on my ancestors to remember their strength, their faith. Maybe that's your path, too. This uh, week was the two-year anniversary of my abuela's passing. And she's been so close to my mind. And I so long to walk in this world with her strength and her capacity to find peace. In 1981, when I was a toddler, my grandfather died. Four years later, my grandma would lose her middle son. And then four years after that, my father would die. My grandmother never stopped finding purpose. She gave, she volunteered at the Catholic Charities. I remember us grandkids did not want to be dragged along to volunteer. (laughs) The only reason we went is because Grandma said if we volunteered, if we helped sort of these foods, we could get a pastry at the end. And we all love sweets. (laughs) So we were like, Grandma, we are down for this. Grandma always found a way to serve. She found her peace. But church, don't mistake my peace for passivity or for passionless permission giving. My peace is found at the bottom of muddy waters, waded through by hungering humans who no longer belong to a country but long for a better homeland for their babies. My peace rests in the wrestling of great-grandparents who sent their children to better lives with only brave faces and two short embraces as they leave the only home they've ever known. Escaping a colonized fight, who said we need to murder our brothers and sisters and siblings across the border you drew? Is it true? Peace be with you all, all of us, all of us, the mess of us. Peace be with us all.